it's a it's a it's a great honor and uh, pleasure and privilege to be joined uh, here today by Christopher, Kate, and Arnie, and about a million people, which is um, it's not making me nervous at all. Uh, no problem. It's uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, I did want to start off, though, by saying that uh, we will hear, I hope, over the course of the next hour, some uh, some uh, of the, 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 the recollections and the perspectives of uh, Kate, Christopher, and Arnie, who obviously have a, a very... Um, unique uh, personal relationship with the with the, the work of Mark Rothko but i wanted to start off by by saying that that these three people probably more than any have contributed uh, significantly to uh, access to awareness of and understanding of the work of of Mark Rothko i was going to uh, run down a, a list of of their achievements and, and contributions but then i realized that i'd be here for for 40 minutes doing that so i decided i would just uh, grab a, a stack of books um and then I realized that I had to carry these down here, and this is all I could manage. So just very quickly, uh, the big giant one on the bottom was uh, published last year by Rizzoli, a book by Kate and Christopher with uh, robust essays by them. And I think just 275 uh, illustrations of uh, works on paper and canvas. Um, the first time, I think, Kate, that you have written about your father and his work, so uh, an amazing achievement. The next one up is uh, is Arnie's book from uh, 2021, 2019, when? Anyway, it doesn't matter, recent. Um, it, it's a, it's a it's an anthology, a compilation of the, the essays that were in the exhibition catalogs of the 11 uh, exhibitions that, uh, that Arnie has organized uh, at Pace Gallery. Uh, and and then there are others on, on the top. Uh, a book of essays by uh, by Christopher about his um, father's work. And I haven't even uh, got to. Kaywin mentioned it. This is this is our show. This is what we're here I I to celebrate uh, the beginning of. But I don't know if any of you have heard. Um, but there's this this small uh, exhibition at the uh, Fondation Louis Vuitton in. Paris that opened last month, uh, curated by Christopher and Suzanne Paget at, uh, at the Fondation uh, Louis Vuitton. What I'd like to do is um, we'll dip in and out, if that's okay, uh, of, of the Paris show, but, um, but I want to sort of uh, trace some of, the, some of uh, your history uh, contributing to, to uh, Rothko scholarship and awareness, uh, and maybe get your perspective on some things. So why don't we just... Um, jump in. I'll be sprinkling in these installation shots from Paris and from our show uh, throughout just to give you some some eye candy. Maybe we can begin actually uh, since we have a, a thousand people in the audience uh, with um, with your thoughts on on the seemingly uh, unquenchable uh, enthusiasm, desire and interest in uh, the work of, of Mark Rothko. What is it about his work that is so appealing? Uh, so popular and maybe so relevant at this moment. This is a lot of Rothko going on right now. I, I guess I'm supposed to start since I'm, uh, I guess the primary culprit involved with this exhibition, although I, I hope you understand from Adam's comments that really everything that happens with Rothko, it's a team approach. First of all, my sister and I always work in coordination and Arnie has been uh, a mentor, a guide, uh, many, many things uh, Rothko to us over, over the years. Um, so uh, this this is one wall of the 1950s gallery in in the Paris exhibition, uh, but you know it's it's been remarkable, especially I mean people keep saying in these troubled moments, in these troubled moments, and it seems like we're always in a troubled moment. Perhaps this one even more so than usual, and 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 people uh, seem to feel the need to have this direct communication with art to experience something that's that's truly human, which I, I would argue uh, comes ultimately from themselves, not from the artwork, but the artwork is a great conduit to to feeling that uh, renewed hope for uh, what uh, the, the human being is, uh, is capable of. I think I'd perhaps point to one of my father's quotes about the importance of timelessness in works of art. And I think his work really does have that quality and maybe that's what makes it that's is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what. <laughs> yes. That's what makes it uh, continue to appeal to generation after generation. I know one of the things that's always most uh, 
emotionally poignant to me is when I see, you know, lines of young people uh, outside museums uh, lined up to see a show of my father's work. And I think that really speaks to the timeless quality, which I think he managed to achieve. The show, the show in Paris uh, and this show, uh, the show in Paris and this show are extraordinary um, bookends. But I think what's really what was really so interesting to me, especially in Paris, is that I think there's no other artist, American artist, who you could put a show on of over 100 works and see masterpiece after masterpiece. I mean, of his peers, you know, Pollock is a great artist, but, you know, you'd have a couple dozen paintings that would speak to you. And it's this, and, and Barney Newman only made 36 big paintings in his whole life. And, um, and de Kooning also, but there's nothing like this. And the idea that he can um, solicit such emotion using color so it was really the power of how does this artist convey emotion, passion, the state of his life through just blocks of color. And this interaction of color is still a phenomenon that Rothko uh, is able to do that. And I, I heard so many people in, um, Wash in uh, Paris say, you know, I just almost wept in that room. And one sees the passion and, you know, he was able to convey that, that passion in um, the Rothko Chapel in Texas, in Houston. So and it's an astonishing artist who seemed so obtuse to people in the beginning and um, was so in advance of their perception. So, um, you know, one of the great geniuses of art history. Okay, let, you mentioned the beginning. Let's go. Let's go to the beginning, shall we? Uh, Christopher, you open the show in Paris with this 1936 uh, self-portrait in a room of early figurative work from the 30s. Oops, what's happening here? Go back. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Arnie, uh, one of the exhibitions that you've done at uh, Pace was uh, figurative paintings. You also opened that exhibition with uh, this 1936 uh, self-portrait. I wonder, Christopher, Arnie, what are you saying uh, to us, to visitors, by starting the show with this, uh, not the classic format, the early figurative works? And what do you think Rothko is telling us uh, or himself in, uh, in painting this particular self-portrait? Do you want to start? Um, sure. Uh, you know, the beginning is very interesting. Of the 11 shows we've done, um, it's been like peeling an onion. Everyone knows the late work very well, but the late work is only the product of all of this work. So um, when we did this exhibition, it was to help people understand where Rothko came from and how his... Um, how his paintings related and even the earliest portraits have a kind of um, halo around them, a kind of fuzzy, brushy uh, uh, paint quality. And when you put this painting next to a late painting, you can see the relationship. I mean, this is also blocks of color. And what I thought was very interesting with this painting is how stern and almost tragic uh, a portrait it is. And he has great, he had great facility, but he really obliterates his own features. And so I, I think it's one of the really haunting paintings and the early paintings look better and better <laughs> and better every year. But when we did the show, people really weren't very interested. <laughs> and they were wondering, why did we do this when we could have done a classic show? But 
that's our job. Our job as a gallery is to reveal the layers of the artist and, um, and, and to reveal the layers of the artist. And that's really where we begin with his painting. Yeah, no, I think it's it's interesting. I think my father himself saw these very much as building blocks. And it's interesting that he really never destroyed any of his work. Uh, he felt he was uh, not only building on the shoulders of the past, and we're looking at a Rembrandt here, of course, one of my father's uh, favorite artists. So, uh, but in a sense, he was building on his own prior work. So it's interesting he never destroyed the work, but also interestingly, he seldom kept it at his home. So we do have one painting in the Paris exhibition, which is actually something that hung on in our home really continually uh, with one move after another, uh, which is interesting that he chose that particular work to keep. And I think it's nice uh, that it's in the exhibit. But to me, it's always a revelation every time I see an exhibit or go into the warehouse and see these earlier works because they were things he really didn't keep around them, even though he clearly thought they were important enough to save. You know, I, I think Mark knew who he was uh, from the beginning. I think he had incredible confidence that he was a great artist. And I think that's why he kept the works. Yeah, this is early 1936. He hasn't really had much success at this point, but he, he clearly seems to be aligning himself with great master. Confidence, right? Well, uh, yes, uh, aspirational confidence. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Rembrandt, you know, the great self-portraitist self -portrait, self probably of all time, it makes what? more than three dozen self-portraits during his lifetime. Our father makes exactly one. I mean, there's some other little sketches that that probably are him, but this is the only time he presents himself to the public in a finished painting. But whereas Rembrandt, you can look into the eyes and find millennia of human suffering. Uh, our father blocks off his eyes. You can't really see them behind the glasses. So yes, he's presenting himself like Rembrandt, but then he says, well, look at me, but don't look at me. And uh, I, I think this is actually the beginning of him uh, already saying, uh, you know, the paintings, uh, it's, it's experiential, it's my process, but also it's not about me. And if you're looking for me, you're looking the wrong place. You have to be looking for you. And so look at the painting, don't look at me. Christopher, remember, I remember asking uh, Mark once, um, who are the artists uh, in the previous generation that really influence you most of all? And he said to me, I'm in competition with the history of art. <laughs> and I think he was. It was a very grand um, scheme. And uh, I think he knew he, who he was when he painted that portrait. Thing. I think you're right. And I think it, without that kind of confidence, there wouldn't have been perseverance he showed through all the years of struggle to arrive at what he found was his uh, final language to communicate uh, with his audience. I can't go back uh, in the slides, but you, Kate, have talked about, have written about looking at Rembrandt with your father. Can you tell us about that? What was that like? Well, it was a quiet experience. Maybe it uh, reflects on his uh, statements about silence being so accurate. But uh, I think his returning with me time and again to the same rooms at the Metropolitan Museum spoke to that particular respect he, uh, he had for Rembrandt. And the thing I remember his pointing out to me most was the light. And I think you can see uh, initially in some of the earlier works, but also the kind of luminescence, the light from within, if you will, that you see in so many of the classic works. He was undoubtedly drawing from Rembrandt in that respect. Uh, the other artists he always pointed to in terms of use of light was Turner. And indeed, when he uh, gave the uh, Seagram murals eventually to the Tate Gallery, one of the things that appealed to him most about that location was its proximity to their large uh, Turner collection. So all this talk of looking sets us up nicely for, for these two small paintings on paper that, that, uh, that we open our show with here. From about the same period, 1937, 38, 
um, I think it sets up nicely the the sort of idea that he had about an ideal experience with a painting, looking closely, um, having a sort of intense communion with with a work of art, and how that could be uh, transformative. Um, can you talk about seeing your father looking at paintings, whether Rembrandt or his own, or was that not something that you? No, I think he uh, was incredibly concerned with the exact proportions of the painting, the exact effect on the viewer. And I think he had to set himself up as that serious observer when uh, when he painted these paintings. But before he decided he was finished, before he sent them out into the world for an audience. So I often caught him. This is probably the only place where he may be caught on camera observing a painting. But this experience for me coming into his studio, particularly as a teenager, when I was probably uh, much more aware, was a constant one. I mean, I remember particularly with the chapel murals, because, of course, I was already well into teenagehood, if you will, when he was painting those paintings and just walking in and finding him not not actively painting, but just spending what could be days observing the painting, deciding whether the exact proportions were right. And we always, uh, you know, we talk about color associated with my father's work, but I really there, uh, realize there's something also very architectural about the work. And of course, that particularly comes out with some of the murals. So not only are you looking at the relationship uh, between a, uh, a central rectangle, if there is one, and sometimes there isn't, and the edge of the painting, but you're also looking at the relationship uh, among the panels. So I think this kind of observation was absolutely typical about him. And it, it, it's interesting because we look at the uh, large volume of uh, works on paper that he painted in 68, and he can't possibly have gone through the same process with those works. And yet the achievement is uh, is so amazing. Quicker, faster. Um, can we talk about uh, his words for a minute? Christopher, you... Um spent some time, I can only imagine, uh, going through a manuscript that uh, Rothko wrote, uh, I guess sometime from the late 30s to 40 or 41. Um, the manuscript itself is in our library, in our rare books collection, thanks to your gener generosity uh, of giving that to the National Gallery of Art. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about his writings, his philosophy, and how he tried to articulate uh, his thoughts about what art should do, how it should work, et cetera. So this is a, a, a manuscript that uh, it, it started life actually as as a book about uh, teaching children uh, how to teach uh, art to children, uh, the, the process of painting, uh, uh, which he was involved with that that process for uh, for nearly 20 years. It was something that he valued a great deal. Uh, but it, it became a vehicle for him to think through his own ideas about um, not just the history of art, and there are, are, there are in fact chapters that really deal primarily with the history of art and what it is about these various moments that where uh, the magic is created or what the struggle of the painter is. But more than anything, I think he is looking in this book at what is what is the role of artists, the artists in society. And he sees the artist as, as um, someone who is almost like a soothsayer, someone whose responsibility is to be to some degree our conscience, but certainly to awaken us to uh, all the ideas. And I, when I'm saying ideas, I mean ideas, time immemorial, really those essences uh, that are seemingly right in front of our eyes all the time, but we're not really looking at them. Uh, so this was his way of working through a lot of those ideas on paper. Uh, and somewhere around 1941, he lets it go and never never picks it back up, never finishes the book, because that process of, of writing about what is the function of the artist and how does uh, uh, the artist address questions of society, he realizes that he can actually paint that better than he's writing it. And he goes right back at it in a new style, uh, which is going to uh, actually progress multiple times uh, through the course of the 1940s until he hits his uh, classic format in, in around 1949. What do you make of this page? Can you read that? What is the popular conception of an artist, question mark? Gather a thousand diverse descriptions and the composite result will be the portrait of a moron.
Can you parse? Shall we just move on? Can you parse that for us? It was time to stop writing, <laughs> but, move on to painting. Well, it's it's right. So this is this is from the essay that we end up putting first in in the book, and and there there was no clear order of essays. I, I I tried to come up with an order that was sensible, but this was an essay that felt a little bit apart, but was clearly intended as like an initial sort of foray, an initial sort of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, announcement about who the artist is and he starts by these uh, you know historical ideas of the artist as this sort of uh uh buffoon genius like the uh, you know the like the king's fool who of course like in the shakespeare plays we learn out that actually well the fool has actually been the one who's understanding what's going out at court all the time so it's he 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 loves to in this book set up paper tigers that he strikes down but yes he sets up the artist as sort of historically someone who's not understood or discounted but in fact might have some things to say to us in a language that maybe isn't the one that we speak all the time but maybe goes a little deeper all right, can we go to the studio? Arnie, what's the what's this location? There's a present day photograph. 69th Street. <clears throat> um, we lived across the street from uh, Mark's studio, and he was an incredibly generous man. I was very young. I was in my 20s. And um, often I'd come home at night well, first, I should tell you, I met him um, through Louise Nevelson. Uh, they were friends. And I said to Louise one day, the artist I'd like to meet most, who I don't know, is Mark Rothko. And she said, oh, I'll take you to lunch with him. So, <laughs> so we did. We went to lunch. And, and I think, actually, it was a moment that most people my age were completely obsessed with pop art. And I certainly was involved with it also. He really hated the movement. <laughs> and, of course, he was looking for something spiritual and sublime. And um, the pop artists were looking in the street for something that was they, they could make sublime out of uh, everyday works. So it was, and very little attention was being paid to the abstract expressionists at that moment. And so this young guy coming in and being so enamored of his work, um, I think he liked that. <laughs> and, and we became friends. And coincidentally, as I said, I lived across the street. So he was really wonderful. I, I was obsessed with his work. And sometimes I come home from my gallery in the winter, you know, it's dark at four o'clock, five o'clock, and a light would be burning in the studio. And so uh, finally I'd work up the courage to knock on the door and say, um, hello, Mark, can I come in? <laughs> and he would show me the works that he was making. And he didn't talk very much about them. I guess I did the talking and sort of he did the listening, but he was so generous. He was so welcoming or, you know, I never would have been able to discuss the work like that. And I saw the um, uh, Houston Chapel murals being done. And um, I visited several times and several nights I didn't come home for dinner and, and Miss Millie and the children were waiting for me, but I was just stuck at Mark's studio because he'd let me be there a little longer. But you never saw him actually painting, did you? I never saw him painting. I saw the results of the day. So you saw these, uh, canvases for the the Houston Chapel in progress. I saw them in progress and I saw the radical changes that happened during the production of these paintings. These paintings kept getting darker and darker and more intense and absorbing more colors that he had worked on. And a lot of purple was in the original um, paintings and it, it certainly comes through. But these these dark pictures, that appear to be black are not black at all. They're the result of multiple uh, layers of paint. And his sense of um, 
he was very aware of what a serious subject he was working with and um, felt a huge responsibility. And uh, I talked to him a little bit about that because it was it was so amusing to me that um, Newman did the Stations of the Cross, <laughs> which are here, and Rothko did this chapel. Uh, later, Nevelson did a chapel in New York City. These are three Jewish artists <laughs> doing Christian chapels. <laughs> it was always so perplexing, but the story that they were dealing with is so awesome. It is such a human story, whatever um, religion it is. It was a story of uh, suffering and redemption and challenges. And Mark was incredible. He could really just zero in on the center of that. And he was a very serious man. You know, Mark's Mark didn't make lots of jokes. <laughs> and, um, but, oh, it's one of the great experiences of my life to have been able to uh, be there, to know him. Uh, I really loved him. Hey, do you want to say anything about the studio, being in the studio, seeing works in uh, in progress or... And, you know, it's interesting to me because uh, you spoke a little on the tour about his having brought in a group of friends to see the black and, and gray works. I was not in that group. And the, those, I was not in the group of people who came in to see his display of black and gray works. So in many ways, uh, and I should also say, uh, there's a series of black and gray papers and a series of brown and gray uh, I'm sorry, black and gray canvases in a series of brown and gray papers, which you'll see a, a, a large collection of upstairs. Uh, so these were paintings that were really a revelation to me after my father's death. Uh, so what I remember seeing in the studio was mainly the work, the chapel works in progress and the incredible dark tones, as Arnie described of those. I did see some of those works in progress, as I said, some of the agonizing over the dimensions. I've always, you know, I think for my father, although he was uh, not a, a practicing uh, religion in any sense of the word, I think he always had a certain spirituality in the background. And I think that's what led him to undertake, uh, you know, creating a chapel, uh, despite the fact that certainly at the time uh, he understood that this was going to be a Catholic chapel. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting that ultimately uh, the chapel uh, turned out to be an ecumenical, non, a totally non-denominational space, which I think would have thrilled him. But of course, he did not live to know that and to see the opening. So, as I said, I, I wish I had been among those who was invited to the uh, to this viewing at the studio of these, uh, you know, a black and I, uh, obviously this photo can't tell the canvases from the papers, but it would have been such a revelation in terms of what he was moving toward next. You know, with um, just a closing note on the chapel thing, he had a very strong Jewish identity. He was very, uh, he took pride in, in being Jewish and a part of a tradition. And I think you can feel it. I can feel it in these paintings. But vis-a-vis -vis that conflagration of people that came to see it, um, it was a pro his he had he felt he had a problem um he made the black and gray paintings and i i wasn't one of the people at that meeting but i was invited the next morning to come so i saw them and he discussed um the meeting with me and what everybody thought and the the problem was do i leave the white frame around the edge of the painting or do i restretch them to um let the painting go around the edges and he was in a quandary and i don't know how much he was influenced by anybody's feelings but most of the people suggested that he re that he stretch restretch them and let the uh, eliminate the frame. Some of them didn't have a frame. Some of them he painted right over the edge. 
So uh, that morning he told me um, about discussions, about the discussions, and and I, I said to him, um, and he said to me, well, what do you think about that? And I, I said to him, I think you should leave them <laughs> as they are. Um, let history decide about this. You know, some have the white edge and some don't have the white edge. And they're radically different. With the white edge, the paintings become a window, which he never worked with before. And they go back into space. And without the white edge, they come forward like weather coming across the plains. And um, so they're these seemingly similar paintings are a radical uh, per, uh, perplexity for Rothko. Um, one, the ones with the edge go against everything he was doing. The ones that go off the edge are a part of what he was doing. But we can see now that they were all a part of the same thing. So um, I hope that maybe, you know, I know so many people didn't like the white edge and I, I really did. So I hope uh, that was a teeny contribution. <laughs> yeah. So you think, so what you're saying is that you single-handedly changed the course <laughs> history. of, uh, of I, I changed history. the history of art. Yes. Christopher, do you want to talk at all about how the white border changes the the way that these paintings function in terms of recession flatness uh and so forth and maybe also uh tell us about what what you did in in paris with this with this series of of canvases well, well i well i do um agree with arnie that the the white border really does change your interaction with the painting it it is uh i won't say it becomes uh something apart from you but there's a, a there's a little bit of a of a scrim if you will between you and the direct experience of the painting um uh, you can you can go look for yourself in in the exhibition upstairs because the last couple of rooms are almost all works on paper which have this white border and this is where he first started playing with that idea and um and it, it does the the paintings uh, are still remarkably vibrant but uh, they are perhaps just just a half step removed from that real uh direct interaction that uh historically uh he uh, had the he put the the viewer in in uh, process with with his own work now what uh, we're seeing here is um the uh last or second to last gallery in the Paris exhibition is quite quite a large room and we have put Rothko in direct um direct interaction with uh two Jacques Amedi sculptures there's actually a third one in the hall just outside the room and this is reflective of a um a, a commission that actually uh never came to fruition but was in discussion with Rothko and Jacques Amedi to make uh works for the new UNESCO headquarters uh apparently both artists expressed um enthusiasm about the idea but it never progressed beyond that there's some question about whether perhaps Rothko's tones these black and gray and brown and gray tones were responsive to Giacometti uh, we do know by the way the Giacometti that, that was intended for that room was uh, one of his walking man figures so we've actually done something that is reasonably authentic to the idea but I will say going into this large gallery which is just referred to by the Breton staff as Le Cathedral, the cathedral uh, it is it is quite a moving space we have um, I believe nine of these paintings in that gallery we've never had this many uh assembled before and it, it is really um uh, it's it's clearly intended as a series even though this is far beyond what would have actually been shown in the in the room in unesco uh and they really they speak to each other and um i i think they evoke a, a similar sense of of loneliness and searching that the, the jacques do for rothko to willingly accept having his work shown with another artist though is something is unusual right he was famously i think it's fair to say controlling over how his works were shown and with whom so this is um this would have been uh, something quite radical and different and maybe maybe that's why it didn't happen or we just don't know I don't think we know. I think we do know that both letter, both artists expressed uh, enthusiasm about the project. So we, I, I think most of it was uh, contractual, uh, but um, and they never got past that stage. Okay, Arnie, uh, one of the one of the many uh, exhibitions you've uh, done at Pace, correct? 
and this is upstairs. So everybody go and, and rush up there after and, and look at these and decide for yourself. Kate, can I ask you a question about these, uh, about the, the brown and grays, the black and grays, but also the very the dark late paintings? You've written or talked in the past about struggling to reconcile uh, or disassociate the the biography, your father's biography from the from the late works. Can you can you talk about that? The associations that have uh, of attached to these late paintings and yeah i think in in many ways the dark works that immediately uh followed the chapel series certainly to me had a biographical uh story to them which i had a lot of trouble for years moving away from it's interesting that i find that the uh black and grays and brown brown on grays to me uh point in a completely new direction which the other late dark works don't. And um, I like Arnie's reference to a window. To me, uh, the early works, perhaps of the 50s, surround you and invite you in in that way, perhaps to uh, examine yourself. These works, to me, sort of entice you to go out the window, to go beyond the painting, to look for something else. So I wonder if, in a way, these were part of my father's searching for something new. Clearly, he was looking uh, for something new with the white borders. Uh, and as I've uh, come to experience these paintings in various exhibits, because it's much more powerful, of course, when they're seen in a group, I really see uh, that he was moving forward in a new direction and where that would have gone had he lived longer, where he would have taken uh, the next room upstairs is, of course, these uh, more pastel works on paper, again, with the right borders, where he would have taken those works. It's very hard to say, but I definitely uh, see uh, both the black and grays, uh, brown and grays and the pastel works as a new direction for him and a positive, optimistic um, move. Yeah, I'm, I'm like just like to add, <clears throat> you know, he never painted during times of depression. Um, painting was a joy for him. It was um, what he lived for. And <clears throat> I don't find the black paintings in any way paintings about death and about the end of life. Um, Actually, the the ones with the white edges, I think they look like we're looking out into eternity. I mean, I find them optimistic. Um, it's so easy to put a <clears throat> to put a. It's so easy to put a label on an artist's work and say, "Oh, they're black. It's about death." I've heard that about other artists. I've heard about uh, um, Reinhardt, about Nevelson. Um, but, you know, it, it's about feeling, and his paintings are so much about the realization of feelings, and he couldn't make work in a depression. Um, I was lucky to know him um, at, uh, you know, times he was as joyous as Mark could be, <laughs> but... Um, you can't, an artist really can't work that way. And then look at the end of the work. There are these pastel pictures. They're like a ba like baby pictures. <laughs> uh, pinks and blues. And, and as Kate says, I think they're so optimistic. So, you know, it doesn't turn from tragedy to uh, optimism. They're different feelings. They're the, they're the whole scope of human emotion. And he's so in touch with it. He's this magician who pulls it out of the air for us to see who we are. Yeah, well said. Um, this is the, I guess, the canvas that was, uh, was found on his easel uh, when he died, which, you know, if there is this kind of conventional story of, of all the work going dark, um, the paintings on paper upstairs would certainly seem to undermine that, but so too this, you know, this so-called final canvas. Um, all right, let's move on. Can we move into the into the? I'd like, I'd like to say something to debunk some things. 
um, I was very much a part of that scene. I knew his contemporaries. And when Rothko's paintings became very luscious, some of his friends accused him of making two beautiful paintings. <laughs> it was a time that tough paintings were what people wanted to make. It was to be an abstract expressionist was to be a really tough artist and irritate the public in some ways. But um, these, um, these works, um, I think, changed also because of the dialogue with other artists, with his friends. Um, I do suspect that there was an influence to go into the darker pictures because he was accused of making such gorgeous paintings. <laughs> so what we what we love now, you know, the abstract expressionists maybe at that point didn't. And then when he made the darker pictures, they all loved it. <laughs> Well, there's the story too of uh, of collectors coming and wanting to buy a happy painting, right? And him, oh, yeah. tell us that story, Arnie. My favorite story. Um, I was in the, came to visit him in the studio one day, and there was a spectacular. There was one painting on the wall, and a spectacular picture. The there was like an um, an entry room to the studio with the sofa and stuff, and there was one painting on that wall. The studio was behind. Okay, there was one painting on that wall and the studio behind. And um, I remarked how much I loved the painting, how spectacular this burgundy and black and rust colored picture was. It moved me enormously. And Mark said, um, you know, I chose this picture for a, a woman who always wanted one of my paintings and she refused it. And it's interesting to know that if you were close enough to be able to get a painting directly from Rothko, he chose the painting for you. You had your choice of one picture. And if, if you didn't take that picture, you never had another chance. So this woman, I think who was affiliated with the modern, uh, said to Mark, um, uh, Mr. Rothko, uh, this is not the kind of painting I want. I want a painting that's a happy painting, a uh, pink, an orange, a red painting, you know, that kind of painting that you make. And Mark said to me, I said to her, pink, orange, red, isn't that the color of an inferno? <laughs> my favorite, my favorite Rothko story. <laughs> Speaking of pink, uh, yellow, and red, this this painting is in the exhibition upstairs, and uh, and we're looking at a photograph of it uh, on the wall inside your home. Can you you mentioned earlier, Kate, about uh, your father hanging his his early works uh, in the in the house? Can you can you tell us more about what what was on the walls? Yeah, this particular painting, I mean, there was a tendency that most of the work that would be hanging in the home was whatever he was working on relatively contemporaneously. Um, this painting, which I guess is in the room of 1959 paintings, would be, um, you know, very close. This picture was probably taken in uh, 1962, I'm uh, guessing, and uh, was one of two papers that I remember particularly hanging in the house, the other one being uh, a much uh, darker palette, but also from the same period. And that room, particularly upstairs, shows this spectrum of palettes that he was using with those 1959 uh, papers. But interestingly, for instance, on uh, an opposing wall was this early nude uh, from 1938, which traveled with us uh, from apartment to house. And, uh, you know, I always remember it hanging. He also had a, a small uh, surrealist uh, painting in entombment, which was hanging again uh, throughout my childhood. And even when we moved later on uh, to this house on the Upper East Side. Um, 
But I would say that probably the majority of paintings in this particular house were from the 1960s, uh, late 1950s, 1960s, and therefore largely in a somewhat darker palette. So this, uh, you know, lighter work on paper stands out in that sense. I was always interested also when we're talking about, uh, you know, how he felt about uh, uh, the uh, lighter palette and what it meant that he constantly prefaced. He wrote a large series of letters to Catherine Koo, who was at the Art Institute of Chicago and organized a relatively early, uh, you know, solo show of my father's there. And he uh, writes at least four letters to her, emphasizing that his paintings are not meant to be an aesthetic experience, because clearly he feels, uh, you know, this is part of his feeling most likely that he's being misinterpreted, and he wants to emphasize that very strongly. Now, whether that got emphasized to the audience who came to the Art Institute, I'm not sure. I don't know what the walls, uh, you know, the wall uh, blurb said, but it certainly got em emphasized to the curator. Sorry, this this is just a shameless plug. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, but I... Available at a store near you. Exactly, it makes a wonderful holiday gift. This is the this is our catalog for the show upstairs. Oh, it's look, an it's amazing the, uh, text. Also, a slide got in there. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's just a, a few more. Um, a, a few, uh, you know, let's let's lighten the mood maybe a little bit with some with some uh, with some fun uh, human side of 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 the man in the house with uh, with dog and cat <laughs> and and on on the wall behind him i should say there is a legitimate reason for for showing these there is a, what appears to be a a small maybe 1958 or 59 painting on paper in in the background well actually we were talking upstairs this is oh, one of one? two we have that are on canvas of oh, that oh. scale i think we all i only can think of uh two of this scale and I was wondering if there is anything in the National Gallery collection. So this uh, deceptively is not a work on paper. Oh, I've been I've been exposed. Uh, you have been exposed. And I'm, I didn't even know you were going to do. OK, this. well, we're, we're, let's set this aside. I am pretty sure <laughs> I'm going to go back into the into the database. OK, well, let's put that. Let's put that aside. OK, <laughs> moving on, moving on. Uh, um. And here we have a, a little plug for this absolutely charming little boy who was in this picture, uh, uh, sitting uh, with his loving, admiring parents. You know, they were uh, doting, and particularly in their somewhat older age. We have a 13-year age gap, so he was a very much long-awaited addition. But they're sitting below closing the gap. This amazing again canvas. Uh, uh, a very well-known surrealist canvas, one of only two that were done on this really large scale, which you only get some impression of here, uh, which is now part of uh, the Museum of Modern Arts collection in New York, but was a particularly uh, personally important uh, painting to both my parents. It was the, uh, the first painting uh, that my mother in 1945 saw my father painting. And it was always near and dear to her heart. And he, uh, this painting had actually been sold in the 1940s, wound up in San Francisco. And he actually traded back in the mid 1960s to bring this painting back to bring, he actually traded uh, a more um, contemporary work, if you will, a, a contemporary for him at that time, to bring this painting back from San Francisco uh, to be in the family collection, if you will. Uh, so we have this wonderful painting of uh, Christopher sitting with the daughter of uh, an artist friend, uh, Daniel Rice, uh, uh, who had a child of uh, maybe nine months younger <laughs> than Christopher. So, And Christopher, here it is in Paris, uh, hung next to Tiresias uh, in a particularly strong wall, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've said, Christopher, in the past that everything you need to know about Rothko is in the 40s. Is that true? Or have I just made that up? 
Tell us about the 40s very quickly. I just I'm just going to say the uh, Tiresias is uh, is what that he's the the blind prophet of Thebes. Um, I'm sensing is there a connection between that early self portrait with the with the black glasses and the the soothsayer, a word you used uh, not 40 minutes ago, um, and and this particular painting in the middle, the tall one uh, of Tiresias. We have photographs of. Of Rothko posing it, uh, posing with it in what, what that, that would have been like 44, 45. Yeah, Tell he's, us. He's, 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 he's extremely fond of this painting, very, very proud of it. We have many, many sketches for this painting, not typical. Sometimes there are one or two sketches, a line drawing, maybe uh, a little watercolor or a crayon sketch. We have multiple sketches for Tiresias. We, we don't know for certain uh, why Tiresias, but yes, this idea of the soothsayer. It's also fascinating that uh, Tiresias was uh, was the uh, the soothsayer, it was the, the prophet who was both male and female at different points of his life. So maybe since Rothko who is always talking about trying to encompass the essential understanding of what it means to be human. Maybe that means to be both male and female at the same time. Um, just very briefly in the 1940s, and I will point out the, the National Gallery for, first of all, hooray for the National Gallery who has taken their collection of Rothko's gift of Mark Rothko Foundation and has made numerous, numerous wonderful exhibitions here, but also small traveling exhibitions that have gone around the country and around the world. So thank you, National Gallery, for, for uh taking very seriously their charge uh, of, of receiving this collection from, from the Mark Rothko Foundation. One of those exhibitions was called the, the Decisive Decade, uh, which is the 1940s. Rothko comes into the 1940s as a figurative painter, passes through mythic painting, a much more abstracted surrealism. You can track this upstairs uh, into a, his first um, fully abstract uh, style, the so-called multi-forms, these not yet quite coalesced uh, patches of color that will come together literally painting by painting till we, till we get to the classic style of two or three rectangles on a field. Um, he's written his book of philosophical writings at the beginning of that decade. Uh, he's gotten divorced and married uh, during that decade. So really his life, he, he really becomes an adult as a person, but he becomes an adult as a painter and really has sorted through so many questions. Let's not forget also the 1940s are cataclysmic uh, in the history of the world. So, um, and in he, he talks about uh, the painter's process as being one towards clarity. Clearly that was true for him in, in the 1940s, stripping away until he got to the essence of what he was trying to say. We did, we did an exhibition uh, with Christopher and Kate uh, called uh, uh, the year 1949. And it was- Painter's Progress was the subtitle, which I, I loved. A Painter's Progress. I actually think you did with Mark, <laughs> that show with my son, Mark, but it was spectacular. <clears throat> and you could see in the room, the evolution of the work <clears throat> just in a few dozen works. How are we doing on time? Some Can someone give me a, a signal if we're- if we're okay, anybody? No. Okay, we're going to noon. Is that all right? Okay, all right. Hey, I can I can stay here all day. All right. Let's see. Let's whiz. Let's let's whiz through some of these and see where we go. Um. Okay. All right. That doesn't look that uh, doesn't look beautiful or anything, does it? Good grief. <laughs> Um, all right, this is an, another installation uh, shot of the Paris show, Christopher. Congratulations, it looks great, etc. Um, as I said before, your father was uh, controlling, question mark, about how his paintings were displayed. Can you tell us about how you decided to hang, juxtapose, and light these? Uh, did you follow his written instructions? Did you look to past uh, exhibitions uh, from during his lifetime? Or did you just vibe it and um, <laughs> and present them as you feel they should be it should be it should be seen? I'm, I'm trying to peer into the series of slides coming up to see if you also have paintings in the 60s gallery where we we uh, the effect is even stronger. So in, in um, 
the the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Um, okay, moving uh, on. So so the, so one of the things that my, our father prescribes that he had a, a the the his big retrospective at MoMA ends up traveling to the Whitechapel Gallery in London. So, which he actually went to go see that exhibition, but he didn't think he was going to go at the time and he knew he couldn't come for the opening. So he sent a series of letters um, to the curator there to um, outline his wishes for how the work should be displayed and how he felt it was most effective. One of those was to hang the paintings very low. Um, and that, again, he wants his face-to-face -face interaction. Yes, you see the MoMA show here. This is MoMA. Well, I will. I will add that the 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 ceiling height is much lower. So I think we had to accommodate. We had to be conscious of the fact that the ceiling height in in Paris was fully, uh, you know, a couple of meters taller than this. But yes, we still hung at uh, thirty centimeters. That was that was our number. Thirty centimeters off the floor. We want you to have that face to face interaction with the paintings. Uh, but he also said that he doesn't want the paintings spotlit. He wants the lights low, but the, does not want the paintings spotlit. Um, what appeared to be more spotlighting in Paris is it's a little bit more of a function of the camera. We have we have darker walls. We're able to keep the lights pretty low in there. That that effect is actually even um, uh, stronger uh, upstairs for the uh, the darker 1960s works. Uh, but uh, but in general, we wanted to both create a room where you walk in and you have the experience of having a collection of Rothko's, Rothko's together that speak with one another, and at the same time to have enough space around them that you can have individual interactions um, with with each painting uh, to really lose yourself in each painting. We were also extremely conscious of uh, the uh, level of visitorship in French museums. Uh, there are thousands of people going through this museum every day, so we wanted to create a spacing that would, would literally be safe where we could have you know, there'd be 15 people clustered in front of a painting, but not, um, you know, 35. So um, uh, all of these, some practical measures, some aesthetic measures, they they do speak to and that you know when they're happy. It's it's quite uh, quite nice uh, feature he built in, and uh, but uh, but also being mindful of of his own wisdom about the paintings to keep the lighting low, let them glow from within, keep the the height low. Wall color, what's the wall color? It's it's a it's a uh, it's a light it's it's a it's, it's a gray with some browns in it not not a deep one but a, but definitely one that does not uh, that's not white and uh, reflect more than the paintings do themselves. And I would say also note the benches, which I think he would have liked. I mean, there's space to have them in this particular space, which is wonderful, but it also allows people to really sit and contemplate the paintings, which I think it's uh, something he really would have liked. Uh the abstract expression, the abstract expressionists in in general, you know, they were not making easel paintings. That was the big, one of the big breaks. These are not easel paintings. And Kate refer, referred to the architectural nature of the paintings. And it's true of that whole generation. That generation wanted you to walk into the painting, to be part of the experience. And it was much easier to be part of the experience if the painting was hung low and you could, and it became something that was all around you rather than something that you were looking at. You know, the painting was sort of looking at you. And uh, it was a hallmark of the period. And you see, the big Pollocks are all hung that way as well. And, um, and, and Mark, I think was one of the people who started it. These are photographs of the Whitechapel uh, installation of that MoMA show, 1961. And these photographs by Sandra Lusada, I think are great in showing uh, just people getting, you know, up, up close and personal, mm -hmm. maybe too close, that... <laughs> no stanchions. Um, okay, architectural, talking about architectural structure, um, do you want to do a quick, a tight two minutes on 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 these, Seagram Commission? Should I start that? <laughs> My era. <laughs> I guess I get this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this was the first uh, time that he had really had an opportunity to play with architecture in a sense and play with uh, more directly with relationships among uh, different panels. Um, this was a group of paintings. And in fact, I have to say they were a large number of panels uh, which he created for this particular series. The series was originally designed to go into a private dining room in the Seagram building in New York, which was in the 
uh, a process of being constructed, the interior design. Uh, it was a uh, Mays van der Rohe uh, was the architect and the interior design was to be done by another architect, Philip Johnson. Uh, the paintings were to occupy the walls of a private dining room. Interestingly, in this case, actually to be hung quite high. So uh, it, it's interesting how he conceptualized that. And of course, that is what has not what has ultimately been done in terms of hanging these paintings. Uh, as you may know, my father uh, went to uh, one dinner when he completed uh, when he completed the panels. Uh, I, they were probably complete by the spring of 1959. The building and restaurant in the building was completed by the fall of 1959. He and my mother were invited to dine there. He uh, came home. Uh, all I can say is I remember uh, the screaming. So that stands out in my mind. He came home outraged about the setting in which these paintings uh, were going to be housed. And the next morning called and went through the commission and actually uh, paid back in advance, which in 1959 may still have been a considerable struggle for him. Uh, the paintings, and again, we don't know if it's the exact same group which was intended uh, for the Seagram space, but a group of nine paintings ultimately made their way to the Tate Gallery, whereas I think I alluded to before, my father would have been particularly happy because he was so in love with Turner. And originally, when these paintings were housed in the older building of the Tate Gallery, uh, they were indeed adjacent to Turner in an adjacent room. Um, but it, it's hard to know exactly what he in term, in, envisioned in terms of relationships because we never got to see those paintings in the original space. And of course, because the space hadn't been created yet, he never got to play with it. And I think he certainly would have wanted that opportunity, you know, in contrast to the chapel mural uh, project where he was actually able to recreate the dimensions of at least three of the eight walls of the chapel as he painted them. Arnie, yet another one of the exhibitions that you've organized, and it's like you've covered everything. Leave, leave something for, for the rest of us, please. Um, there's a lot more to be. There's a lot more to be found, and I'm going to find it. <laughs> um, but I think that it, what Kate was saying uh, about his um, outrage, um, it was a very expensive restaurant. Uh, it was the Four Seasons, and um, Mark was a socialist. Mark was a socialist on the edge of a communist, and his generation of artists, and indeed a lot of people, um, a lot of people I knew from my parents' generation, they had very socialist ideas, and they um, and they were very active, and and Mark couldn't bear to see these paintings in a rich person's uh, cafeteria. And, um, and he was right. He was right. Uh, and so there's a set in, uh, we did this exhibition as the first exhibition that we made together. And I love these paintings. And, uh, and it was surprising to people because nobody really knew these paintings and, until this show. And we showed, I th think, nine paintings or I think more than 12 paintings. And and we sold the entire set to the Kawamura Museum in Japan, outside of Tokyo, where they still remain. And uh, it's extraordinary to go there and see them. Their installation is beautiful. People come as a pilgrimage just to see them. So that was incredibly exciting for me that uh, we could have a hand in placing these pictures in a permanent place. And I think this uh, first exhibit was also unique because it was actually taking place at the same time as the first retrospective of my father's work when the paintings came back into the estate. And it was just this unique opportunity to show this contrasting group of paintings because none of the mural series were included in the retrospective. So this was a wonderful complimentary uh, show 
uh, to that retrospective and just incredibly powerful. Yeah, for, for me, they're some of the greatest paintings here in Maine. And you can see the source of these <laughs> paintings. So this is the Laurentian Library and um, by Michelangelo. And he, you can see how he, he went to his, um, he went to Rome just before he started making those paintings. Florence. Yes, and I actually think he may originally have seen the room in his uh, trip in 1950, which, uh, you know, may have been his original source of inspiration. Okay, let's, we have eight minutes left. I want to, I want to get to something if we can. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> I don't care what's happening. It's happening in front of uh, my well favorite. Yes, Moscow. the reason. Yes, that Kate, you saw right through me. <laughs> the reason that I'm showing this is not because of the cute cat in a pot or whatever, or this conservators avert your eyes. That cake is uh, too close to the painting in the background. With a knife, that's not safe. Anyway, back to this one. Yeah, the reason that I'm showing it is uh, is because of the painting uh, in in the background. Um, tell us about this this painting, please. Well, this is incredible painting. It first of all, uh, this is a painting called "Homage to Matisse," and it has the uh, privilege, if you will, of being the only painting. Uh, uh, post-1950, or, uh, or even before that, probably post-1948, which bore a title rather than a number. And it was clearly, it was painted in 1954, shortly after Matisse died. Uh, it was painted in 1954, uh, shortly after Matisse's death. Um, I, even as a young child, remember uh, visiting the Museum of Modern Art with my father. We actually lived only a couple of blocks from the museum. Uh, so we were frequent visitors. And Matisse, of course, uh, figured uh, very prominently in, uh, in that collection. And as, as I believe it's the Red Studio, which Adam has been greatly disappointed because I can't I can't say that that's the Matisse that struck me as a three or four year old. I was more, I think it's the painting, The Dance, which was very, very prominently displayed in uh, the entryway of MoMA at the time. But clearly Matisse, uh, not surprisingly from his colors, was someone who really, um, uh, you know, I think spoke to my father and therefore his titling this painting. And it hung in our... Uh, our apartment for many, many years. It's a painting I always felt like I grew up with. Um, and it was a great disappointment to see it uh, disappear into private hands fairly early on after my father's death. And unfortunately, uh, at least not yet to have made it into a public collection. Hopefully that will still happen in the future. I have a story about this painting. <laughs> So I, I was uh, looking at this painting in a private collection and um, I was going to meet Mark uh, lunchtime and I came into the studio and I said, you know, I was just looking at homage to Matisse, which I adore. I think it's one of the great paintings. Um, and I said, you, you must have felt a great affinity to Matisse uh, because both of them are considered the greatest colorists of the century. And um, and he said, yes, I like Matisse very much, but if you really want to see color, look at Bonnard. And that was a clue for me. And together, we made this amazing exhibition of Rothko and Bonnard and put paintings together that was staggering. Some almost looked like the same hand. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't have associated that with him until he said that. Um, so that was really, that was a great triumph for all of us. I'm sorry, Arnie, that I don't have a slide of that exhibition here. I, I'm, I'm I sorry, failed. too. I've failed. <laughs> we sent you slides of that exhibition. <laughs> Yes, apologies, apologies. Um, 
the reason I, I, I the reason I did uh, put this in this in the slideshow was, of course, because of the Matisse connection. But I also was hoping, Kate, that you might talk about what you mentioned there before about works that have disappeared out of the the public sphere and the the trial that you um, that you were involved with. If you're willing to to tell us a little bit about that, I I think people would be very interested. Well, it's a long story, but in brief, we have four uh, minutes. <laughs> four minutes, <laughs> maybe two, if we want any any question, time for questions. But uh, in brief, uh, with uh, we found out uh, somewhat in retrospect that within about two months of my father's death, every painting in the that was uh, remained in the estate, which included homage to Matisse at the time, had either been. Uh, sold or consigned to Marlboro Gallery, which was one of the most powerful ga galleries in New York at the time. Now, this was a slow process. So this was clearly uh, kind of done under wraps uh, by the executors of his estate. And it was not till more than a year later that the uh, exact uh, details of what had occurred became clear. But I think from the very uh, moment I had any hint that the paintings were no longer part of the estate, were no longer going to go to the Mark Rothko Foundation, which he had so carefully uh, set up when I was a teenager, particularly because he was so concerned about his audience, because he wanted uh, the care with which he placed his paintings to be continued after his death. I don't think there was any intention of setting up a Mark Rothko Museum but he wanted the foundation to carefully place the works, probably mainly in public collections. And I think as early as maybe six months after he died, I had my first hint that the paintings were no longer available when I had asked if I was going to get anything from the estate, could I have that in the form of paintings? And there was a lot of humming and hawing on the part of the executors. So clearly there was something wrong. But uh, to make a very uh, long story short, we discovered that all the paintings had been consigned, that the Mark Rothko Foundation had basically been relegated to receiving whatever uh, cash had been generated and, uh, you know, not really carrying out its initial purpose. And I would say uh, initially, uh, uh, about uh, five years later, at the end of 1974, uh, four, where there was an initial uh, ruling in a lawsuit that was to return the paintings to the estate to the extent that they had not been sold. And for example, homage to Matisse at the time, I think it now has a much better home, but had gone into the vault of a bank had been sold by uh, the gallery and gone into a bank vault. So uh, there were two more appeals, and it wasn't until the end of 1978 that, or toward the end of 1978 that it was clear that the paintings were going to remain back in the estate. And at that time, uh, as we, we said, we organized several exhibitions, but most importantly, after uh, the trial was won, uh, the attorney general and uh, uh, Gustave Harrow, who was intimately involved in the case, I don't think uh, the, the case would ever have been won without his involvement and his widow, uh, Lori, is here today with us, which is just wonderful to have her, um, was charged uh, by the court with reconstituting the board of the Mark Rothko Foundation, because clearly the three executors who had now been removed had been the, not the only uh, members of the foundation, but the foundation had also actively supported the gallery and the executors in the case. So clearly the foundation had to be recreated created. Clearly, I'm sorry, clearly the foundation had to be recreated basically from scratch. So uh, Gus and I had a fair amount of discussion. He also did a great deal of his own research in terms of determining the composition of the foundation. But um, uh, perhaps most significantly, uh, I had known uh, Donald Blinken even as a child or a young teenager and was well aware that he was one of my father's very earliest and most serious collectors. So his name immediately jumped to mind as someone who should be uh, involved with the foundation and, and indeed head the foundation. And so I can only say that the lawsuit was the beginning of a long pursuit to bring the paintings back to the estate 
to the foundation and then allow the foundation to do what it had originally been intended to do, which was carefully place the paintings. And I was not really directly involved in that because I became the new executor of the estate. So I was sort of over the entire estate and wanted to be hands off uh, with the foundation. They were their own entity. But all I can say is I could not be happier uh, then and now with their decision to give the bulk of the paintings to the National Gallery. I think they could not have found a better home. Uh, the care that has been, uh, you know, executed already has been amazing. And they have capabilities such as Christopher mentioned to send paintings around the country and the commitment to do that. So we were thrilled with that decision and thankful uh, to Donald Blinken, who led the foundation. Yes, here, 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 here. You did in like four minutes what uh, Lee Seldes in the book takes of however many, 400 pages. To, just to recap, though, uh, heroically at age, what, 20? You 19, 19 single-handedly brought a lawsuit uh, against the most powerful uh, entity in the art world and uh, managed to retain, to keep um, your father's uh, art in the public sphere. Otherwise, it would have gone into dark vaults. So, um, yeah. we, thank you, thank you, Adam. I, I was going to call her my my eyeless sister for a moment because yeah, that your 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 agency in that was uh, discounted in 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 your retelling. But uh, we we are all we are all in your debt. Yes, we all thank you. The National Gallery of Art thanks you. The nation thanks you, Kate. Thanks. And I look back and I say, was that really me? Could I have done that? <laughs> but I guess so. And I, I was very lucky uh, to marry rather uh, young and have my husband uh, see me through the whole thing as well. So it was very important.